So once again, uh, good afternoon to everyone. This is uh, indeed a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this online webinar session, which we call the knowledge sharing session from EIT Extension, which EIT Extension is regularly uh, doing it at least twice a month or thrice a month. And today's uh, webinar will be on how patents help start up to grow and stay competitive. I believe uh, it's afternoon to most of you, but uh, those of you who are attending from another parts of the world, it's a uh, good morning and good evening uh, to all of you. So my name is uh, MD Zakir Hossein. You can simply call me Zakir. I will be the co-host and the moderator for this session. And just to let you know about the session or this online session or webinar, this will be roughly around one hour session. And we have uh, this welcoming speech at the beginning and followed by the welcoming speech, we'll introduce the main speaker, the respected speakers for today's online session. And then he will be delivering his uh, talk uh, within around 30 to 40 minutes. And that will be followed by a Q&A session, which will be uh, five to 10 minutes Q&A sessions. After the Q&A sessions, we'll go into the closing and the uh, vote of thanks. So that's overall about the session. I think uh, before I introduce the speaker, our respected speakers for today's session, let me talk a little bit about uh, today's topic, uh, which is how patents help a startup to grow and stay competitive. I think startup and uh, entrepreneurship is uh, the two key words that most of us are familiar with. We are kind of uh, promoting this. We are kind of uh, uh, improving this part. So we are introducing these things to the academia. We are, we are uh, noticing these are coming up from the SMEs, from individuals and from different perspectives. Now, what is patents to do with uh, it? Or what is the role of patent in, in this? I think this is, is all about, uh, this today's session is all about. And I believe uh, patent is something that probably is not new. Uh, sometimes it also can be within the broader aspects of IPR or intellectual property or intellectual property rights which is probably something that is not new for a bigger company or larger company, because the larger companies or uh, the larger setup or institutions, they have the R&Ds and the R&D units is basically are well known to these uh, things, which is IP and uh, patents. And they are quite familiar and they can actually do it. But I think this is much more challenging for the new startups and uh, probably the individuals who are becoming the new entrepreneurs. So for the new startups and the new entrepreneurs, this is something which is very, very important. And those of you are actually into this as a new entrepreneur or, or actually opening up a new startup, I think this session is going to be very useful for all of you. I think that's a little thing I would like to uh, talk about. I, I'm not an expert, of course, in this area, so I will not take time. Uh, to to talk and to go deeper into into this. So now it is my role to actually introduce uh, our respected uh, and distinguished speaker for today's uh, session, who is uh, Dr. Akarawit Kanjanaopas. Dr. Akarawit Kanjanaopas is from Thailand, uh, one of our good friend and uh, also very well known to us. So. He is now currently uh, holding the position as a very high level expert on intellectual property and foresight at Thailand Science Research and Innovation, or simply known as TSRI. TSRI is a national agency responsible for research, and innovation, policy, and strategy for, for Thailand. Uh, I think before uh, coming into this uh, agency, uh, Dr. Akarawit was with. NSTDA, which is uh, Thailand's premier institution in science and technology. NSTDA, those of you who uh, do not know, is called Thailand Science and Technology Development Agency. Dr. 
Akaroit was there as a vice president and also many other roles and has played a wonderful role in the arena called uh, Food Inopolis. I will talk a little bit about that. Uh, I think it will take a long time if I just uh, speak uh, about his uh, credentials and the achievements. I will try to be very brief in this area. Dr. Akarawit Kanjana Opas, as I was telling, he's from Thailand. He has a bachelor degree from Prince of Songkla University, which is in uh, south of Thailand, in the field called food science and technology. After his bachelor degree, he went to Chulalongkorn University, which is uh, the premier uh, university or the number one university in Thailand, where he did his master degree in biotechnology. And I think after his master degree, he joined the Coca-Cola Thailand as a uh, chemist. He was uh, there for little more than two years, and then he moved to U.S. for his uh, Ph.D. education. And he did this PhD on marine chemistry from the Script International Institution of Oceanography from the University of California in San Diego. Immediately after his PhD, he came back to Thailand and he joined uh, Prince of Songkla University uh, in the department called Department of Industrial Biotechnology, where I think he is still associated with since then. And uh, he has been, of course, teaching, doing research in this uh, field of marine natural products chemistry and marine biotechnology. He has done a wonderful work in this field uh, that is very fascinating. It's called, he's leading actually the discovery of novel genera and the species of marine gliding bacteria, which are highly potential and producing bioactive con compounds and enzymes, which I understand is very, very important for the medicine or uh, uh, and, and cosmetics industry, I, I, I understand. I think he has been doing a wonderful research and he has got a lot of achievements in this field. He has become top 20 researchers in his field also very recently. I think I'll, with that, I just would like to bring back to his time uh, with uh, PSU and uh, later on to NSTDA. As I was taking, uh, talking that he is a, he's a professor, he is an academic and he's a researcher at PSU, but he's also uh, the director of PSU Science Park for more than 12 years. And after serving there as the director of PS, uh, PSU Science Park, he moved to National Science and Technology Development Agency as a vice president where he's still associated with and then where he actually become the key person to establish and drive this government initiative project called Food Inopolis that I just mentioned briefly. Uh, Food Inopolis is actually the first specialized area of innovation focusing on food and agriculture in the ASEAN region. Uh, this is some somewhere where he had played a leadership role. So I think that's uh, all about Dr. Akara with Kanjana Opas I'd like to speak with, because as I said, if I uh, keep speaking about his credentials and achievements, it will take a lot of time. Uh, with that, it is uh, our great pleasure and of course an honor to welcome Dr. Akara with to start his session. And we believe he will be taking 30 to 40 minutes to deliver his session. And we will go into the Q&A after that. Just for all of your uh, uh, information, uh, participants, if you have any question and query about this special topic, you can uh, feel free to write in the Q&A box. I believe the Q&A box is all uh, active for all of you. So you can write your uh, questions into the Q&A box. If you have also other queries and other things and any issues, you can also write into the chat box. So with that, uh, allow me to hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Akarovit Kanchana Opas. Over to you, Achan. Thank you very much, Dr. Hussein, um, for your warm welcome and kind introduction. Um, good afternoon um, for those of you uh, uh, listening to this seminar from um, Thailand and um, for um, the special uh, topics that are um, provided by AAT Extension. This is the first time, actually, that someone 
um, invites me to talk about a specific intellectual property right um, for a patent and uh, for a specific target group, which is the a startup company. And um, I think it is a wonderful time to, to share uh, this information with you this afternoon. If you look at the, uh, a famous uh, J-curve for a startup, you will see exactly what Dr. Hussein has described um, earlier, that um, startup is actually quite different and unique from uh, the larger enterprise when they started uh, the uh, business with the R&D department or innovation department, they actually have a, a very uh, comprehensive um, activities in order to protect what they have created through through the R&D program. But if you look at the J-curve of the startup, what happened is that the startup didn't have or doesn't have the revenue from day one because all they do is actually they come come up with the idea, a very innovative idea, trying to solve um, the problems that can be scaled um, um, either domestically or globally. So in the first period of the startup, as, as we all know, they have to spend a lot of money in order to create something that is very unique and very um, uh, useful in order for the customer to, to pay for it later on. In this period, that is kind of a below ground, we call it the valley of death. So once they get it right and they want to scale, that is when they come um, to the the, the uh, stage of uh, competition. And the topic of today is how to make the startup grow and stay competitive. One of the key elements that um, help startup to stay competitive and to be able to grow um, in competition with um, the existing company can be the small, medium-sized company or the large company or even the multinational companies to utilize what we call the unfair advantage and the competitive uh, advantage. And intellectual property, right, especially patent, is one of the uh, important tools for that. The reason is, if you look at the, the component of the intellectual property in general, Intellectual property not only involved with the legal uh, issue, but also with the business and the technology. So the topic today is how do we uh, align um, the all these three components together for the startup to be able to stay uh, uh, competitive and to be able to grow without having to compete uh, with someone that are, they actually uh, come before them. So what will happen is that um, startup, you have to look into what are the value proposition. So first thing first is that the startup have to come up with the products or the service that actually solve the problems of, of the customers. So either the product or the service that they have created, they have to be able to exploit or utilize the proper intellectual property right to protect their invention, to protect their uh, novel products or services. If they can package it uh, properly, this become a very unique value proposition and become the, the unfair advantage or the uh, competitive advantage that can be put into their business model canvas. And this make them stay competitive. So um, with that value proposition in the middle, protected by the patents, mostly for the technology company. Um, they then can uh, build around their business model, which I will not go into the detail about how the business model involves around the intellectual property rights. But there's actually one article came out um, early this year, uh, looking into the um, startup intellectual property right or the patents that the startup have from the investor point of view, why the investor do like to see the startup that they want to invest that hold um, the intellectual property, that held the intellectual property rights. As I said earlier, the patent give the startup the competitive advantage because the intellectual property right in general, specifically for the patent, is allow only the owner of that uh, patent 
to utilize to make or to sell the products and exclude the other from doing so, even though they can do it, but without the permission from the patent right owner, um, the others may not be able to do that. Secondly, um, the investor see the patent um, of the startup as the evidence of innovation. Sometimes it's very difficult to prove because the idea and the innovation sometimes is very intangible. It's not only something that you will see as an equipment or the tangible products, but it's somehow like a business model or the method of doing something. So um, by having the uh, patent granted or the patent application even, it's a proof that um, this innovation is has already been materialized. Thirdly, um, when the startup would like to get the investment or move up the ladder, um, they want to increase the, the value of the company. And one of the major uh, criteria of um, considering the value of, of the startup company or the tech startup company is how, how many or how good their uh, patents uh, are. The other thing is um, the patent right gives the startup the opportunity to be seen by the big companies. And this brings to, uh, to useful um, um, solution. First, they may want the big company to become their customer. Or secondly, they may want uh, some joint venture or investment that coming from, from the big company. It depends on the business model of the startup company, whether they want to grow uh, by themselves or they want to grow with a strategic partner or the co-investor. Last but not least is that the patent right gives the startup the right to protect or defend themselves in the case of uh, infringement, if it happens. So these are the three, five reasons that I think the startup should um, give a, a big um, significant um, con consideration to try to have um, the uh, intellectual property right, especially for the patent, um, if they want to grow and stay competitive. Then. So this picture is kind of uh, the analogy to to give you an idea uh, if you are the first mover, the, the front runner of that kind of technology or in that particular industry, you want to put the hurdles on some other competitors not to run as fast as you are. So it's like um, you put the hurdles uh, surround you in order to slow down other competitors. So we already talked about the value of death a little bit early on. So how that pattern can uh, help with uh, filling the gap of the value of death. First thing first, if the startup is it's, uh, born with, with the idea and have not yet executed that idea into the products or to the service through the R&D process or to the execution process of doing innovation, I would recommend that um, that entrepreneur or the co-founder teams should pay attention to um, what we call patent search and analysis in order for them to understand the technology landscape and also the patentability uh, issue, whether they are able to protect that idea if they, uh, if they are successful with, with the execution of the R&D. Let's say that they move on, they come up with a prototype and they still um, want to uh, scale or to test the market, you still need to consider um, the intellectual property or the patent information analysis in order to move on to in the next stage, which is called freedom to operate. Sometimes people confuse between the patentability analysis and the freedom to operate analysis. Patentability analysis in general is to look into whether it is possible for the researcher or innovator or entrepreneur to protect their invention or their innovation with uh, the patent rights. But when it comes to the freedom to operate, you are only looking into the territory that you want to execute uh, your business operation. So if, let's say, you want to operate um, or sell the products only in ASEAN country, when you do the freedom to operate analysis, you may find some patent application or the, the granted patent in Europe or in the US. 
that doesn't count um, for uh, freedom to operate analysis because those patents um, cannot um, enforce their rights in ASEAN territory if they have not filed the application in, in ASEAN territory, as I mentioned earlier. So this uh, similar technique, but focusing on, on um, different result and outcome. So mostly a uh, startup or the tech startup in any country would start from the research institute or higher education like university or institute of technology like AIT. So my recommendation for uh, those of you who are researchers, engineers who want to become entrepreneur and set up uh, a startup company later on is to make sure that do you all the things in the red boxes properly. For example, um, like I said, intellectual property and technology landscape, you must protect your intellectual property according to your business plan because the patent rights only allow you to register the patent in a certain period of time after you file at the first country. So mostly it's only 18 months after you file your patent application in the first country. If you already passed the 18 months period, it, it means that you are no longer allowed to file the patent application in any other countries. So this is very serious because most of the researchers and, and invent innovators uh, do not understand about the, the filing strategy. Once you secure everything in the red boxes uh, properly, then you can seek out uh, a funding starting from seed fund, Series A, Series B, where the startup journey will begin. So even with the funding agency in Thailand or in any other countries in general, they would look back into your um, historical background. Where do you um, do your research? How do you obtain your uh, invention, have you already filed your patent application to protect your invention? Otherwise, they will not be able to uh, grant you uh, a bigger uh, funding uh, money in order to, to moving right along to translational research or field trial or even clinical trial. After that, the venture capital will come. You know, after you have the risk, your uh, innovation, your the risk, your technology, by proving them um, that uh, you can make uh, minimum viable products or the prototype and your intellectual property right, for example, the patent right has already been secured properly, then the venture capital will come. And as I mentioned earlier, the top five reasons that the investor look into the startup company uh, using the um, lens of, of the, the patent rights, you, it gives you the uh, opportunity better than not having intellectual property right uh, protected. So um, these are the three phases that I would recommend for any startup to um, keep doing the patent monitoring um, until you have launched your product to the market. Um, you shouldn't uh, do the patent monitoring or the freedom to operate check just at the beginning of your uh, establishment of your company because things might change. Um, what you what you search, what you analyze today, uh, it may be a different story tomorrow because anyone can come up with any idea. They, can, they may file the patent application three, six months ago and 
tomorrow it become um, available in the public domain. So if you only check it at the beginning of, of the establishment of your startup company, you might uh, run it a risk. So I would recommend monitoring the uh, patent landscape regularly. This depends on how competitive or how fast the technology uh, in, in, in your domain are. Some, some area, uh, things are moving quite fast. For example, you might have to monitoring them on the weekly basis. Some technology develop a little bit uh, slower. So you might monitoring um, your patent landscape regarding the technology that is the core technology of your startup company just on the monthly basis. So um, let's take a closer look into uh, what does the patent right um, uh, give you. So um, the patent right give you the um, opportunity to protect your invention. So what can be the invention according to the, the patent law, which is quite similar to any countries in the world? First thing first, it has to have the subject matter. Uh, you have to be able to say that um, what is the what is this invention all about? What are the technical character of this invention? So um, it can be um, a product, it can be a surface, uh, a process, but some um, in some country are excluded. For example, in Thailand, for a software uh, invention, we do not allow uh, the uh, inventor to register as a patent application um, for software is still under the Thai copyright law. But in any other countries, you may be able to patent your software. Um, but in Thailand, there's a way to get around with that. If that software actually help operating a device that you have already invented together with that application, you may be able to put the uh, a program or a software into your claim by saying that you invent the system which consists of the hardware and the software. So in general, it's it's give you the right to protect um, the system, including hardware and software together. But standalone, um, the software is protected under the the copyright uh, law. The invention must be new, and the invention must be inventive. Inventive means it's not so obvious to anyone with the skill in the art of that particular technology to be able to figure out. That means it has to be a little bit more complex and um, challenging in order to come up with that invention. So um, how can you obtain uh, the patent? As I said, that the patent used the registration system. So in order for you to obtain the right, it is totally different from the copyright. The copyright, once you have completed the creation of your work, it's protected um, automatically, but patent is different. Um, in order to, to obtain your protection um, uh, or patent rights, you need to, to turn in your application, the, the draft of the patent application. So the filing date has become very important. And if you file more than one country, the first country that you file is also important. That is what we call the priority country which um, start uh, counting down to the 18 months until um, the, the deadline that you can file um, in any other countries. It has to be done within the 18 months. After you file the patent application, then the patent office um, will uh, examine the patent in general, and then they will disclose the information to the public database of each patent office, and it's, we call it the public patent publication. In that period, you can see who has similar invention to you. But before the publication date, all the information is confidential. So this is the reason why I stated earlier that you cannot be certain that um, from the beginning of, of the patent analysis, everything will stay the same because um, in any day, there will be a new patent application um, that has been published in the uh, patent office. And it takes time to examine the patent before it grants. So you have to wait maybe one year, two years, three years. In some country, in some cases, you may have to wait um, five, five years or more. But you don't need to worry about that because the patent, uh, once it's granted, is actually dated the protection 
uh, period back to the date of the filing, not the date that the patent has been granted. So um, this is quite important for the startup to be able to understand once they have filed the patent, they have to know when that exclusivity right will end. It's 20 years from the filing date, not the 20 years after the patent has been granted. So uh, this is just a brief overview of for those of you who have not seen um, um, the patent application or the, pat the patent before. They have a lot of information in um, one patent, which you may not be able to find in any other um, uh, articles or, or um, information um, as the academic journals. So you are able to see who are the inventors, what are the titles of the invention, when that invention has been um, filed for the protection, in which country, and then you can read um, briefly about the summary of the invention. And then, uh, but the heart of the invention is actually the, um, the claim which is um, the most important thing about the patent application. So um, the reason that I bring this up for the startup or, or for researchers or entrepreneur is that make sure that you give your best effort in order to draft your claim. You must understand your invention very well because then you can explain it to the patent attorney, um, what is your invention? How do you want to protect it? And um, what can it do? You know, what can be the alternatives or the option to your invention? How can you prevent other people from uh, inventing around your research? Because you cannot do in every um, possibilities, but um, the way that you draft your claims in your patent application, it is critical to to give you uh, the best um, protection right for your invention. So um, you must understand uh, your invention well, whether your invention is just the product or just the process or both. Because if you discover or if you invent both product and process, you should be able to get your protection for both product and process. This will indicate in the claim. But sometimes I see the uh, patent application of the researchers or the, the inventor. They only draft the claim for the product, even though they invented the new process. So when it comes to the enforcement, if someone used their process and, and came up with uh, different products, you may not be able to... to um, uh, file the lawsuit against that competitor because uh, you only ask for the protection of the product, not the process. So um, I stated again that um, pay uh, a lot of attention to how do you draft your claim. If you cannot do it by yourself, um, uh, ask for advice from uh, the IP expert in your institutions or um or in in the um the law firm that that are uh, experience have experience with with um filing the patent application. So um, how many type of patent um, in general? Usually um, in Thailand we have um patent design pa patent and also the utility model patent. In um, other countries they may have only two types of the patent, which is the, the invention patent and the design. The utility model patent only exists in some countries where they allow the inventor to file for a small invention that is not too complicated because they want to promote or to encourage the local uh, inventor to, to protect the rights of, of their invention. And the differences between the in invention pattern and the design pattern is um, actually the scope of the protection. For the design pattern, we do not give the protection right for the function or the method of using that particular invention. It's only protect the form, the patterns, or the design the, of, of the invention. So, can 
the inventor and the owner of the patent be a different person? Yes, it can. Um, first thing first, the inventor, if they are the private inventor or the entrepreneur who is not employed by um, the employer, they can always um, be entitled to to file the patent application on on their be on on under their names. But if they are employee of the um, universities or the company, sometimes they have an agreement between the employee and the employer that saying that whatever you have invented as an employee, um, it will belong to the employer. So you have to assign your uh, right to your employer. And then, but under the Thai law, if the right has been uh, transferred from the inventor to the employer, um, the employer must uh, pay or share some uh, benefits back to the inventor in case of the, in, that patent can be can be uh, commercialized. So in the case of, let's say, one of the AIT students or uh, AIT staff invented something and then they licensed to start a company uh, here in Thailand and want to expand it to the ASEAN market. So what to be done is that AIT professor must ask for the license permission from AIT and then the AIT will grant them the right to use and then they have the agreement to to do um, a benefit sharing between the company, the startup company and the AIT. Once the AIC have received the benefit sharing coming from that startup company, I'm sure that AIT has a, a regulations um, saying that how much the inventor get, you know, in case of in case of the commercialization of the patent. So these are the, the general ideas. So it can be um, a different person. It, the owner and the inventor can be a different person, and most of the time you will see that the case for the employee and the employer. So. Um, my recommendation, um, this is the last part of my talk, my recommendation for a tech startup or, or for an uh, entrepreneur uh, to utilize the patent right is you must understand that if your invention is or can be reverse engineered, I think patent right will give you the best shot for protection uh, for protection of, of your um invention of, of your products or services. But if your innovation is difficult to be reverse engineer, I would recommend you consider the trade secrets, which is another intellectual property rights. For example, if you have a formulation of a certain secret sauce for uh, some seasoning ingredients, you may not need a patent. You, you may consider using the trade secrets because you don't have to reveal um, your invention, but you have to make sure also that um, nobody can reverse engineer that secret sauce so easily. So this is the, the decision to be made by the inventor and the researchers, especially when they want to uh, set up a startup company around their invention, whether which kind of intellectual property rights that they consider to to uh, protect. And patent may not be the best uh, always, but um, if that invention is so easily to be reverse engineered and that patent uh, right will be the best job for that. So I think for, uh, for the sake of the seminar today, that how patent right give the startup uh, the opportunity to grow and uh, to stay competitive. I am sure that uh, the audience is already see that um, without patent protection, most of the tech startup company can actually um, cannot actually uh, grow their business and remain competitiveness because um, they have no way of protecting the competition coming from from three hundred sixty degree. So um, the big investment. One of the big investments that the startup always uh, invest when they get funding and or investment in the in the early stage is to uh, seek out for a, a patent protection in in many country as possible according to their business plan or their business model. So with that, I return it back to Dr. Hussein for q and A. Q&A. I'll be happy to answer any question any question the audience might have. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Dr. Akarawit Kanjanaupas. I think uh, it was really fascinating and uh, very well defined and much more deeper knowledge that we have actually got from you in this field of patenting and how patent can help a startup to grow and stay competitive. I would now sit for Q&A and uh, I will check the Q&A box. If someone is asking you directly, Professor Dr. Oh. Akaroiti, please uh, take that question. But so far in the Q&A box, I don't see any question or queries also in the chat box. Uh, dear participants, as I have uh, written in the chat box that if you have any queries, any question, please feel free to ask right in the Q&A box or in the chat box, or you can raise your hand. So I think this is the time if one of you or some of you would like to raise your hand, please uh, feel free to do so. If anybody have any question, uh, I think the talk was very fascinating. Uh, Dr. Akarwit actually took us uh, in deeper understanding of how patenting is going to help us when you are thinking about becoming an entrepreneur or when you are coming up with a startup. And I think he has uh, explained very nicely about the process, about the rules and regulations and all the benefits and the problems if you do not have the patent. Okay, I think the questions are coming. Now we have one question. Uh, I would like to read uh, Dr. Akharwapit. Okay. The question is from Mr. Bahul Sreshta. And the question is, how is patent rights law in Thailand? Is it still developing? And it seems to be a continuous development. Yeah, absolutely. We had the patent right for about 20-something um, years now from the, when the first patent act um, was um, was um, um, created. But um, as we all know that uh, the international law and the international agreement always um, um, developing. So there are some um, improvement of the, the patent law to, to become um, to become the in agreement or in line with the uh, with the international agreement. For example, um, something that has always been discussed in Thailand is that whether the patent the copyright should be should be patented or a plant variety should be patented. So um, this also depends on the negotiation between the the governments and and the um, and the uh, international um, arena. So to answer to your question is actually um, the they are in the process of revising the new patent law, but it has not yet been um, been uh, completed. I, from what I know, it might be um, coming out um, within a year or two from now. Um, other than that, uh, we still uh, believe that our current patent law is actually uh, quite up to date um, uh, and align with with the international regime, except for uh, certain things. That, like, for example, in our Article Nine in Patent Law, um, we say something like a public order and, and morality. We may see something different because of the culture, um, the cultural differences. But other than that, in terms of the invention and 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 other thing, it's um it's quite in line with the international regime. Thank you. I think uh, participants will keep asking other questions. So I had a couple of questions maybe I can ask uh, taking this opportunity. I see there is a question from Maya, but Maya, I will come back to your question after I ask uh, my question to uh, Dr. Akarwit. So my first question is, uh, Dr. Akarwit, you have mentioned about the Death Valley, and mm -hmm. that was really well explained. Uh, I was just uh, asking, uh, is there a general figure for Thailand, like uh, uh, how many percentage of uh, kind of this startup actually fall into this dead valley <laughs> or or probably opposite, how many percent got uh, success? Success, right. Yes. In and, and, and the question related to that is uh, uh, those who have failed, what do you think, what are the main reasons that they have failed? Ah, okay. And uh, those who have succeeded, what are the main 
key factors they have actually succeeded? Okay, that that's a great question actually uh, regarding the uh, success of of the, the startup. In general, I think um, the data um, worldwide would say that um, depending on um, the ecosystem of each country, but in general, I think one third of the startup would would su- succeed, and two third would would fail for for many reasons to that. In some country, the chance of the startup um, is even less or even um, better. For Thailand, I think um, um, uh, in general, we think about well, one out of 10 um, uh, tech startup uh, would, would succeed because um, our ecosystem still have um, um, a, a little bit of a under support in terms of law and, and regulation, like, for example, um, some tax regime that is not so um, attractive for um, uh, big money coming from from um, the investor because they, they still have some uh, tax regime that um, other countries provide a better um, attractions. So um, the key success factor for a successful tech startup would be first thing first, how good their technology is. And that related to the topic that we discussed today. Sometimes technology is very good, but it's just um, the researcher or the inventor um, lack of the awareness about intellectual property rights, especially patent. They never check the patent landscape when they do research. Mm-hmm. So uh, they believe that their technology is good, um, but when we conduct the patent landscape or freedom to operate analysis, it turned out that um, there are already some existing uh, technology which are patented um, somewhere. Um, so that some ca- somehow um, stop the startup to move forward or getting uh, support from, from the investor. If the technology is good with a, te- uh, a patented um, right uh, secured, uh, the second factor would be the team, um, researchers, uh, entrepreneurs, CEO, CTO, mm-hmm. and uh, the teams um, play a very important role for mm-hmm. for the successful of the startup. And last but not least is the, the ecosystem. ecosystem. And that's the reason why in many countries, um, they try to say that they are the best place for the startup to grow. Mm-hmm. So come to our country if you want to set up a new venture. Okay. We have a complete ecosystem. Mm-hmm. So when we zoom down to a certain country, they 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 may have even um, a competition among the, the cities. Uh, come to my city because we provide the ecosystem for, for your startup. When we zoom down to the city, it may be a competition be, between institutions uh, like university, science park, or the incubator accelerator trying to recruit mm-hmm. the startup into their program. So um, the third factor is also quite important for the success of the startup. Um, so that to answer to your question, what what are the, the, the key? Uh, Thank you very much. Parameters? I think we are now having a couple of questions. So let me take my next uh, question from the chat box. And it is from Maya. Mm-hmm. Maya asked, is, uh, Maya said, thank you for the informative lecture. I have a question. What if someone modify a technology patented by someone already? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know whether it is reverse engineering or yeah. something else. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, mm. And who can own the modification? Absolutely. Well, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, of course, the person who invented the modification owned the modification. Mm-hmm. Because the law only say that is your modification new? Yes, if it's new, it's patentable. Is your inf- um, modification um, inventive enough? Yes, then you can. You are completed by the patentability criteria. Mm-hmm. But what Maya has asked bring up another question. Let's say um, the person who modified um, the the existing uh, technology which is patented they already own the new patent but it doesn't give them the right to use that modification without asking the permit- permission of the previous uh, patent uh, right owner mm-hmm. in case that that modification is stacking on top of the fundamental 
uh, technology. Okay. But if the modification is not stacking on top, you invent away from the existing pattern protection scope. Mm -hmm. You have the full right to utilize your patents for commercialization. I'll give you one of my classic example. Let's say Dr. Hussein owned a, a donut. You, you, you have a patent about the recipe, the formulation of making a donut, and you fry a dough, and then you, you know, sprinkle it with the sugar. That's a traditional donut, and you still own the patent. And I came up with the modification. I changed from the sprinkle of the sugar uh, crystal to become a, a caramelized or the um, glazing recipe of the donut. But I still use your donut recipe. I still make a dough according to your pattern. Mm -hmm. I still fry my donut according to the process, the temperature, the oil, you know, everything is the same. My only modification is that once I obtain a donut, I don't sprinkle the sugar powder or the sugar particles, mm -hmm. but I make a recipe to glaze that donut. Of course, I get a patent application for that. But will I be able to utilize my patent mm -hmm. and start a donut a shop or donut factory? Mm -hmm. No, I have to go back and ask Dr. Hussein, will you allow me to, to use your donut patent? Because I suspect that I might infringe your uh, patent claims for a formulation of the donut, for the process of making donut. Vice versa, you, Dr. Hussein, uh, is not allowed mm -hmm. to place your donut according to my patent application. Okay. We both have freedom to operate okay. on our patent, but it doesn't mean that I can start my uh, commercialization based, based on my uh, donut right away, which is totally different from if I look at your patent first, this is the point that I emphasize over and over again for the startup. I am well aware that you own the patent for donut. So I will do my research to my best in order to invent a way from your donut recipe. Maybe I don't use the wheat flour. Maybe I use the, the glutinous rice flour. Mm -hmm. So it become a gluten-free donut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my formulation is different from your pattern. Mm -hmm. I don't fry, I bake, and then I glaze my donut. Mm -hmm. So my, my modification based on the information that I learned from your pattern is separate clearly from from the the pattern of of Dr. Hussein. I have full freedom to operate. I don't have to go back and ask you for 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 your permission of to license out. Thank you, thank you, wonderful and a great explanation. Uh, so the next question I will pick uh, from the Q and A box, and uh, the question is from Dr. Pallobi, our colleague. And her question is, how do startups strike a balance between patenting their innovations to gain a competitive advantage and sharing knowledge through open innovation or partnerships to accelerate growth? Uh -huh. Associated question is, are there specific considerations or best practices that startups should keep in mind when navigating this decision? Absolutely. Um, this always comes from, from researchers and students in academia. You know, you have your role and responsibility of uh, providing knowledge uh, coming out from your research and your um, studies. Okay. At the same time, you don't want to disclose everything to become a public domain and then everyone use it for, for free. And you yourself who invested in the R&D will not be able to obtain um, any, any return back. My advice to this is you have to, to have the filing strategy, a good filing strategy if you want to do both, which means you want to commercialization that and you want to also provide the information to the public domain. I recommend you to filing the patent application first and then you can dis disseminate that information to public without invalidating um, or um, preventing you from obtaining the patent, which is not the case if you published or, uh, or presenting your work to the, the conference uh, first, and then later on filing the patent application. That 
actually obstruct you from obtaining your patent right because you have already disclosed the information prior to the patent filing date. So if you want to do both, to balance between um, commercialization and the public domain dissemination of the knowledge, I recommend you to file in the patent application first and then you can do whatever you want. Thank you, Dr. Akarit. We have the next question from Justin Flins. And Justin question, Justin has two questions. So the first question is, can you share insights on how startups can balance the cost of obtaining patents with the potential long-term benefits to their business? Okay, um, to, to obtain the patent right, it's quite costly, as, as we all know. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, go back to what I talked earlier. You have to select um, the territory where you want to file the patent because each territory costs you money. Okay. So you have to bear in mind yeah. and you have to think carefully, where are you going to set up your business? Where are you going to send the products? Mm -hmm. You may set up a company in India, Mm -hmm. And then you sell the products to 10 countries. Mm -hmm. What are the 10 countries that you are going to sell the products? Mm -hmm. You will not be able to file the patent in 50 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. So your business strategy and uh, intellectual property management patent mm -hmm. filing strategy has to be aligned. That's how you balance between the, um, the cost of obtaining the patent right and the uh, revenue that you will uh, get it back in return. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you have to consider whether, um, how long are you going to use that um, technology or um, pattern? Because you may come up with a new version three years after you filing the first pattern. Mm -hmm. So you will, not, you will not pay for 20 years of the pattern of the first one. Mm -hmm because you already have the second one that is much better than. Mm -hmm. So this depends on the business strategy, depending on your, um, your um, invention, whether, you know, how often you want to develop a new invention based on that. And most of the times, if you get money from VC or the investor, and the VC and investor may want you to keep it as long as possible with their money, then it's, it's okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, from Justin, we have another question. How important is it for startups to develop a comprehensive IP strategy? And what are the key components of such a strategy? Absolutely. It is critically important because the entire company for the startup is built around one core technology. Mm -hmm. If you don't own it, or if you your technology is actually similar to someone else's technology, or even worse, is infringing someone else's technology, you don't have a business. Mm -hmm. So your intellectual property strategy is very critical for the tech startup. Mm -hmm. And the key component is starting from the R&D. Are you well aware that um, the technology that you are going to develop, mm -hmm. which may take three to five years in mm -hmm. some case, mm -hmm. is actually patentable, mm -hmm. is actually new? is actually you have a freedom to operate. Secondly, business strategy has to, to set the direction for your IP strategy as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think we have a question from an anonymous attendee. And the question is, what would happen after the patent validity end, let's say after 20 years? Um, it become a public domain. That means everyone can use it. Mm -hmm. This is the case that uh, many people know about the generic drug right when mostly the new drug come out um, they invest billion and billions of us dollar to go through the clinical trial and get the fda approved mm -hmm. so the patent lasts for about 20 years after the patent expire anybody with the technology or the manufacturing capability can actually make and produce and sell that drug Mm -hmm. and it become a generic drug. So um, once the patent expires, it becomes a public domain. So every patent has a validity period, correct? 20 years from the first filing date. Okay, 20 years. Okay. Associated question from me, I was uh, thinking to ask you, like, uh, are there really benefits of having patent? 
let's say you talked about my donuts, correct? So what are the benefits if I have my patent for my donuts? Absolutely. Is, is, this, is this something like I'm going to get some benefits from the government mm -hmm. or the VC, venture capitalist, yeah. or the investor? Thank you. Um, besides the five benefits that an investor yeah. uh, gives uh, significant consideration to the startup that has the patent, mm -hmm. I think the uh, businessman or the entrepreneur who own the patent right, yeah. you can actually uh, choose the option of your uh, execution, whether you want to set up a company and run it by yourself, or you said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not a businessman. I'm a good researcher. I'm a good engineer. But my invention is very good, and I already get the patent protection. Mm -hmm. If anyone interested, yeah, come talk to me. I'm willing to license to you, and then you pay me back uh, for the value that I agreed. Okay, okay, yeah. So then you can go back and do your research um, with with money coming every year from the royalty and 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 um, the upfront fee that you get from licensing out your patent. So that is the the monetary benefits for for uh, the patent owner. The second benefits would be when uh, would be non-financial benefit or non-monetary benefit is that mm -hmm. when we look at the competitiveness of the company or we want to look at the, who is the most innovative company for example you want to do a recruitment of a young staff yeah. coming out from university you want to recruit top-notch students and you say that uh, our company is actually invest a lot in r d and we have uh, file patent application worldwide around a thousand patent application per year. That would attract, you know, human resources and talent to come and work with you because they know that their talent will be will be uh, rewarded. Their talent will be, um, you know, uh, regarded uh, at that organization. So um, this is what we call non monetary benefits. And some country. Um, um, who has a patent, uh, a number of patent higher than other countries, um, can use it for attract foreign direct investment as well. I'm sorry. I think I don't see any other question in Q&A and the chat box. Maybe I can ask my last question, which is also from a layman point of view. Uh, because it sounds like, you know, applying for a patent is also very kind of a very rigorous process is there. You have to understand the legal plus something academic also as well. Are there kind of agencies or farms, mm -hmm. like a law firms, for example, are helping the SMEs or individuals to get their patent? Absolutely. Um, for the case of Thailand, if, if you are a small, medium enterprise or a startup, mm -hmm. and you are affiliated with uh, academic institutions like universities or colleges, most of the Thai public universities has a unit called Technology Licensing Office or IP Management Office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they don't have it on their campus, they might have a network of the Technology Licensing Office or the IP Management Office, mm -hmm. which can help preparing you for a, a patent uh, drafting and patent mm -hmm. filing. Mm -hmm. The Department of Intellectual Properties also have the uh, hotline and, and online services for a free consultations regarding uh, intellectual property rights mm -hmm. in all forms that the small medium-sized company or the private um, entrepreneur or private researcher innovator can also, um, can also consult the department of intellectual properties of course there's a law firm in thailand specializing in intellectual properties and there are many of them and, but of course, that law firm, you know, they run it as a business. So um, it, it's a cost that you have to pay um, for for their service fee. But um, the ecosystem for intellectual property uh, protection in Thailand is quite good, I would say. You can choose whatever appropriate um, to, to your resources. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rakharit Anjana Wapas. I think that's uh, conclude our q and session. And... Uh, this is the time for closing. So at first, of course, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you from uh, all of us here at AIT Extension and from AIT. 
to you for this wonderful deliberation and the knowledge that you have delivered for all of us. Uh, it's a great uh, thing for us also to learn. And I think uh, we do have many other reasons that we are actually conducting this online or the free webinars. Uh, with that, uh, colleagues uh, and dear participants, I think it is time to close this uh, uh, online session, as we mentioned at the beginning that we are going to take maybe roughly an hour. I think we have crossed that time. As you probably know already, but those of you who are new or attending a uh, first time into this webinar or the webinar from AIT Extension, uh, for all of you, uh, this webinar is actually uh, coordinated by AIT Extension of Asian Institute of Technology. AIT Extension is mandated for uh, coordinating, designing, and implementing uh, training and the professional capacity building programs in many different areas, as you probably know. And of course, this is an area that we have just uh, uh, delivered today, uh, which is about patent and how the patent can help the startups uh, grow and stay competitive. This is an area we also have an interest to uh, design and develop and uh, implement training and capacity building programs. So that is something probably you would be interested to be connected with us. You would like to maybe send us queries. So please feel free to do that uh, to, to us, to any of our colleagues at AIT Extension. But of course, as you know, that uh, AIT Extension is working in many different areas uh, in this area of uh, professional training, capacity building, also consulting and research. So if you have any queries for uh, kind of uh, taking the services or also uh, kind of partnering with us into any of these ventures or what, please feel free to communicate with us. I think with that, uh, i like to conclude uh, this uh, session here. And uh, uh, again, to, to, to all of you, uh, thank you very, very much for, for participating to this. And uh, uh, at last, of course, I would like to convey our gratitude and thanks to all my colleagues uh, from AIT Extension who have actually helped us uh, coordinating uh, this session. So thank you very, very much. Again, uh, a good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to all of you. Yeah.